Okay, with that out of the way, let me quickly thank um, Ralph and Jeff again for um, taking the time um, in setting up this presentation, and not only this presentation, but also the previous two parts. So thank you very much, Ralph and Jeff. Um, the previous two parts are already available on the EasyBuild YouTube channel, and part one is quickly um, climbing up to be the most popular uh, video on our channel right now. So it's pretty clear that this is awesome. an important topic to to cover. And with that, I'll pass the word to Ralph, who will start uh, part three of the presentation. Thanks, Kenneth, and uh, and thanks everybody for attending. Um, obviously, this is presented by the Easy Build com uh, com sorry community. My mouth. Anyway, um, and uh, we want to give uh, some uh, recognition and thanks to them for uh, for this opportunity to explain this to you. Uh, like uh, like Kenneth said, the session is being recorded. We ask that you uh, put your questions in the Q and A panel, so uh, Kenneth will moderate those and pass them along to us. Uh, we welcome them uh, as we go forward, and anything we can't cover as we're going, we will take care of uh, at the end. So uh, as a quick overview, there were several things covered in part one, and then again in part two. Uh, I think. Uh, you can see there the breakdown of it. Today, what we're going to concentrate on is going over the uh, PIMX reference runtime environment and then uh, go into configuration and debugging tips and then uh, give you a, some previews of what's going to come up in the 4.1 and 5.0 series from, uh, from OpenMPI. Uh, we talked about doing a recap amongst ourselves, and, and the answer is it's just there's just too much. Um, so. I've provided some links here uh, that'll be in the slides when we distribute them to point you to the uh, the part one and part two video and slides. Um, I apologize for that, but we just couldn't come up with a meaningful recap that wouldn't consume a large part of the uh, of the session. So uh, with that, let, let's launch into PERTE, uh, as we call it. Um, oh, and before I actually do that, uh, let me go ahead and, and these are some questions that were left over from session two that pertain to, to PIMIX. And uh, I want to go ahead and address them here. So uh, we had a question about examples of applications for the asynchronous cross model uh, coordination activity. Uh, I have a link here to a, a, a Euro MPI paper from uh, 2018. Um, I couldn't find the link that I wanted to find. There was another paper given at supercomputing by uh, by the same author, Jeff Wall, uh, Valley, um, and uh, that also went over it. Um, so I would refer you to those. Uh, there's also some, um, you know, some uh, portion of the uh, PIMIC standard. There's a chapter that uh, actually deals with this as well. So uh, you can get it in any of those three places. Uh, pros and cons of S run versus MPI run. I know Jeff touched on this a little bit, but I thought I'd go ahead and answer a little more about it from my perspective. Um, MPI run obviously offers a lot more options because it's specific to that MPI implementation. Um, and it has a, uh, uh, the MPI run you'll find in OpenMPI has a larger range of PIMIC support in it. It does a lot of stuff like the dynamics, the job control, and the monitoring features that I described are all supported in there. Um, the con to, to using MPI run is it, it historically it's MPI implementation specific. So if you use the MPI exec or MPI run from say MPISH, you won't find any of those features in there. So it, it, it really varies around between the MPI implementations. But for open MPI, it does cover a lot of this. And that even gets more extensive when we go to OP V5 because we actually embed uh, what we're going to talk about today, this PMIX reference runtime environment or PERTE, that's actually embedded in OP V5 itself. So it, it expands the range of what you can do. S run, biggest, the biggest positive for it is it works the same regardless of what MPI implementation you're running against it. Um, and so that's that's really the biggest benefit to it. Uh, the negative, like I say, is it doesn't have all the options. Um, I was asked about giving a separate talk that goes through the, the PIMIX launch orchestration process, uh, procedure. I'm happy to do that. I'll talk with Kenneth about scheduling it. 
Um, it's just about an hour long talk to walk through it all, but it is, it does go through all the things about how you orchestrate or interact with storage systems and fabrics as, as well. So, um, I'll be happy to do that. So, uh, what is PERTE? Well, as I said, it's the PEMEX reference runtime environment. Um, it's kept up to date with the uh, with PMIX uh, in terms of both the master branch uh, of the repo as well as obviously any release branches. So, whatever is in the PIMIX uh, standard, um, the latest version of PIMIX standard is fully supported in this runtime. Um, it's actually set up so you can do it on a per user basis. So you can just you know get your allocation and then just launch Perte in it, and it'll fill the allocation for you. And be and then uh, you basically it looks just like a shim. So, um, you know everything that that's available from Pimix, you can then run underneath Perte, even if your host environment, whatever it is, Slurm, Job Step Manager, whatever it is, um, even if that doesn't support it. So, one of the places it's used a lot is on Craze, since Craze doesn't support dynamic uh, environments or multi-application environments very well, uh, if at all. Uh, so people are using this as a way of getting around that, where they get a, a, an allocation from their Cray uh, Alps environment or Shasta if you're if you're started moving to there, and then they launch Perte underneath it, so that they can go ahead and run workflows and other such things um, uh, cleanly. So it, it's a persistent DVM. Um, it launches all the its statements on all the allocated nodes at the beginning. And then you just use uh, it's it has a p run tool is called that takes the place of, of MPI run and you just launch your applications using p run and they run against the DVM. Then when you're done, there's a p term command that will go ahead and tear it all down. Uh, it comes actually out of uh, open MPI, the original runtime uh, Orte out of there, but it forked several years ago. It's its own standalone project now. And it, uh, there's a bunch of people that are looking at including it in their distribution. Actually, I guess that will be included in their distribution with the next Perte release. So uh, this is how it's used. Like I said, uh, you, you get your allocation, you tell you you execute Perte, it reads the allocation and launches daemons everywhere, and then when you do per, uh, p run, it will these daemons will fork exec the procs everywhere. And it completely isolates you for any limitations of the host environment. So it's used in, like I said, it shims as a shim in all the non full featured environments. Cray Alps is a really popular one. Slurm is another one where you see it a lot. Um, you know, PBS Pro environments that people are using it there. In fact, the Altair guys have said that they may very well package Perte along with PBS. Uh, in the future, so that when you start up PBS, it automatically just launches Perte underneath it uh, as a as a launch support mechanism. Uh, so you might see that coming out like you know later this year. Um, it also provides a user level development environment. So uh, like so the debugger guys when they've been de were uh, de developing their integration with Pimix, they actually were using Perte to do that because they could just start it up and then have Pimix based environment. And they could do it for each user and didn't wind up, you know, it didn't have to be running as root. Um, one of the more popular uses is a, as a workflow for workflow managers. We're seeing this now being integrated in by the national labs into their, their workflow managers like Adios and Swift T and, and others. And um, because it gives them this full dynamic operations, multi app and multi tenant operations are supported. And it's actually very fast as launching. There's been several papers published on this where you can launch your applications, um, you know, up to several hundred times faster than you can, for example, with like Alps, which is one of the ones that was compared against. And then, like I said, it's going to be the base runtime for OMPI going forward after V5 or starting with V5. So it kind of fits like this in OpenMPI. It's actually its own separate little project area. Uh, it has it uses the same MCA uh, uh, framework system that uh, all the other OP related projects do. And you'll find there's a bunch of, of uh, frameworks in there. And I'll talk about some of those. So like I said, same MCA component architecture. We, we just stole it straight out of OpenMPI. It's the same build system as OpenMPI. 
The big difference is there are no embedded libraries in this, so it requires libevent and hwloc. Uh, it also requires pimix, and uh, we only support versions 3.1 and above, but none of those are embedded, so they have to be provided externally. Um, there are optional things in here, so if you want to run in a PBS environment, for example, we have support for that, support for ALPS, LSF, and Grid Engine. We auto detect all of those, so you don't have to manually specify them unless they're not in standard locations. Then you need to tell us where they are. We also auto detect Slurm, uh, and we have Singularity, uh, built in Singularity support here, so you can launch containers uh, without necessarily um, having to tell us that it's a Singularity container. And uh, for those interested, you can go to the uh, the uh, Scilabs uh, website, and they'll they'll tell you about this integration. And uh, if there are questions about it, I can point you to some of the things. And we also uh, auto detect Zlib. Um, that's or libz, but uh, we we do need that or use that for compression of of the data for faster launch. So um, so that's a valuable thing. If we see it, we will use it. Uh, some of the key frameworks here, uh, there's a there's the process placement one called RMAPS. There's the interdaemon communication system called the OOB for out of band. Uh, there's also the launch system that launches the daemons and also uh, uh, communicates the launch command to those daemons called PLM. And then the entire PERTE system basically is an event driven uh, state machine, asynchronous state machine. And so the framework is called obviously state. Uh, and then down here at the bottom, I provide you with a link to a, um, a, a set of instructions, uh, starting with how do you get the software, but it actually walks you through how to build it and how to run it. There's an adaptive command line in this system. So uh, PERTE um, really is designed to support multiple MPIs and also OSHMEM environments, et cetera. And so uh, each of those guys, uh, communities, have their own command line. So uh, OpenMPI has certain command line options. MPISH has others for their hybrid uh, Hydra system. And so to pick those up and make them as comfortable as possible for users, we added uh, what we call the schizo framework. And it allows us to create plugins that then uh, detect which version we're actually running, what, what, what we're trying to support, if it's MPISH, OpenMPI, or various versions of OSHMEM are all supported in there. And then we configure the command line to look for the options that that particular environment um, natively supports. And that detection is based on the absolute path of the ARCV. So when we see, you know, which which P run you are executing, um, what the alias is for it. Uh, we will go through and look at that absolute path. There's a set of um, you know, configuration files, .ini files, that we expect to find in our installed uh, prefix slash et cetera region. And those INI files contain, here are the absolute paths to the sim links to P run and what those what those absolute paths relate to. So in an OMP INI file, for example, what this thing is saying is that if the sim link being used has an absolute path to MPI run that looks like as, as shown here, then that is actually being run as, a, as an open MPI alias. Same for this next one for MPI exec or for the OSH run for the open, uh, OSHMEM uh, embedded version in open MPI. So if we look at the argv zero for P run, uh, for the uh, alias of, that's being executed for P run, and we see that this is the sim link that's being actually used, then we will use configure the command line to look for open MPI command options. If we see that it's in the mpish.ini file, that that's where that sim link, sim link was defined, then we'll configure the command line to use mpish command line options. So, you know, the, uh, the mpish guys are looking at perhaps converting over from Hydra to using uh, PERTE as their base based on this sim link uh, capability and the ability to reconfigure the command line. So you may see more of this being used in the future by other uh, uh, programming libraries 
uh, as a way of, of just having a standardized uh, runtime. MCA parameters are obviously part of uh, PERTE since it's based on the same uh, MCA system. There's a, a major difference in how these are handled from uh, what you're used to in OpenMPI, and, and you're going to see that reflected in, in the OMPV5. And the reason is because there's actually a two-step system here. One is you start the DVM with PERTE, and so once you start that DVM, obviously MCA parameters that would have related to the frameworks that the DVM specifically uses, like you know OOB and R. Oops, sorry, uh, OOB and RML, etc. Those those uh, MCA parameters really have to be given to PERTE. If you give them to PRUN, uh, when you start to when you actually tell the job to launch, it won't know what to do with them. So. Um, so that that is something you have to be aware of as to when these things have to be provided. Now, if it's a sim link where somebody's typing MPI run, then you're okay, all right, because it'll automatically be passed to PERTE. But if you are running them separately, if you're doing the DVM mode where you're launching PERTE separately and then doing P run to launch your applications, you need to be aware of this. Um, so it, in in most cases, if you're doing PERTE, you'll find that the MCA parameters only control the default behavior. So for example, the mapping or the binding options. And then the per job behavior is controlled by P run command line options. And we ignore any MCA parameter on that command line for those values. So I know this is a little confusing. I'm running through it fast because of our time constraints. I can easily come back and give you guys more information about this. I'm also putting it on the website to help guide people uh, when they look at PERTE. Uh, but it, it's it's a little bit, it, it's basically that these uh, main ones up here, uh, the, looking at the DVM, these apply to the DVM level connections and behaviors themselves. They're not something that changes on a per job basis. There are these things like RMAPs and HWLOC that do get changed on a per job basis, and therefore they are only set by, uh, you only set the default behavior with the MCA parameters, and then we control it on the P run command line for each job. Uh, a lot of ORTE MCA params are gone uh, because they just don't apply to PERTE, uh, and, and so we just don't support them. Uh, there's a standardized way for, for querying and setting these runtime parameters. Um, there's lots of ways you can you can do uh, the MCA parameters. Um, so we have, you know, uh, this gets a little confusing, but I'll try my best to get through it. I, again, we're going to document this for you. But basically, uh, if you're looking at open MPI parameters, the double dash MCA uh, will work and we will note we will uh, automatically translate that to being an OMP MCA parameter if we see it pertains to an OMP framework. Uh, we do respect the OMP MCA uh, environmental variables. We do have still uh, respect the open MPI uh, default params files and the system level params files. So both user and system are supported. We do a similar parameter for uh, a pattern for PIMX. So PIMX per MCA parameters are supported in the, in the environment. There's also the user level and the system level file. And we do the exact same thing for PERTE. Okay. So you have three levels of MCA parameters that you can deal with. There are some differences. So PERTE command lines. Um, Jeff gets off gets gets excited about this, so I'll just emphasize it here. Uh, all the PERTE commands have only a single R in them. The, the the project has two R's because it's an acronym, but because we don't like stuttering when we type, we uh, we only have one R in the commands. So you use PERTE to start the DVM, P run to launch the jobs. OMP uh, prefixed uh, MCA parameters should be with the O in front. To indicate that they're OMPI. Uh, again, we will look at the vanilla MCA param uh, option, and we will translate it if we see that it really that the framework being uh, referenced, the parameter being referenced, is an OMPI parameter. Then we have PIMX MCAs and PERTE MCAs explicitly called out. 
as to what they are. And then, like I said, we will do for the generic MCA. We do our best to match it based on the value of the, uh, the parameter name against the known frameworks by the project. Right now, we've got them all pretty well nailed down, but you know, it's better if you use the specific ones so we know. Uh, like I said, NVARs and the param files, we, we pick those up. Uh, PIMIX will automatically pick up the system and user default param va values for both OpenMPI and PIMIX and forward those, and PERTATE is the same for its own. So you don't have to worry about forwarding things out. We do it for you. Uh, some of the build tips. So PERTE has no public APIs. Applications never link against PERTE. Okay, so you don't have to worry about mixing and matching PIMIX and libevent HWLOCs uh, between PERTE and any of the application libraries. It doesn't matter. Um, we, I want to emphasize again about the symlink uh, thing. We need that so we know which version is being executed. And so we know when somebody types MPI run, you know, which one, uh, which command line we should be mimicking. So be sure you do set up those INI files. Uh, like I said, <laughs> this is for Jeff. Perte is the project name. Uh, it's been around for a while. All the packages and libraries are labeled with two R's in it. Little uh, single R is the operational name and because users had trouble stuttering when they were typing, and so it got confusing. So we just said, okay, Perte is the operational name, and it's just all the tools and MCA parameters, all that is with a single R. Uh, there are a set of tools that come. Uh, there's a wrapper compiler, which you really don't need to use. Uh, it, it's it's there solely to ensure that if you want to build an, a, a, an app to run it against Perte, um, we will make sure that all the PIMIX, libevent, HWLOC things are all you know properly taken care of. Um, but it's just there for convenience. Really, we use it mostly for testing purposes, but um, uh, it is there if, if somebody wants to use it. Obviously, PERTE is there. That's the starts the DVM up. There's a PERTE info, a la MPI, MPI info or OMP info uh, that gives you all the build information. The daemon for the back end nodes is there. P run is the launcher. And then P term is what you use to stop the DVM. Uh, some debugging tips. So obviously uh, this thing is designed to scale. It's been run on you know uh, clusters with 10,000 nodes on it. It, run, it scales very well. But um, if you want to simulate it on a small allocation just for test purposes, uh, there's a certain MCA parameter you can set, which is the route it routed one. If you set routed radix to one, it creates a linear chain on the daemons. It looks it basically looks just like a scalable communication system, except it's got a, a, a scaling uh, factor of one. Um, so if you if you want to, you can just you can you know take an eight eight node cluster and make it look like it was uh, you know like a, an eight times sixty four size cluster. Um, and then uh, you can also use this RAS based multiplier. This allows you to launch multiple daemons per node. You can't run MPI jobs this way because shared memory gets confused. Um, but you can use it uh, just for testing runtime scalability to verify that you know you can launch uh, you know a bin true uh, or a host name application and verify that uh, that it's running at scale. Uh, there are PIMIX tools to help you with diagnostic, diagnostics. Uh, I won't go over those here, um, but uh, but they are there. And then there's also a verbosity, just like you may, have, may be familiar with OpenMPI. I would suggest there's starting points that there's uh, the launcher, PLM-based verbose. There's the asynchronous state machine, the state-based verbose. Set those equal to five. You'll get a lot of detail of what's going on. Those need to be set for the PERTE command itself. Um, it lets you see what the command line is and what all the output is from the remote daemons and things. Uh, if you're having trouble with the, the, the DVM itself, you can set the OOB base verbose and the error manager base verbose. That'll let you see what the communication is and what the errors are. Uh, if, and if things are working, uh, daemons are starting, but procs aren't working, first thing I always do is just set the PEMIX server verbose option to five. 
Again, that's on the PERTE command line. Um, and that will tell you what PERTE is seeing come out of the uh, PIMIX library. So my concluding remarks, uh, again, thank you uh, for your attention and especially Kenneth for setting all this up. Um, I just wanna give you a reminder that uh, there's a, uh, that PIMIX is the standard. Okay, it's a document. Open PIMIX is the library. That's the reference implementation of the PIMIX standard. At the moment, it's the only implementation out there I'm not hearing from anybody that they want to write their own. It's a lot of code and uh, it, it's just a lot of plumbing. Um, but someday somebody might. So uh, we do have it separate from the standard. And then PERTE is the, is the re reference runtime environment and it gives you this full featured environment. Um, if, if you want the PIMIX uh, support, uh, there is a, a growing movement to provide it. I mean, it is there in uh, Slurm, um, and uh, and you, you it will be there in in like Shasta. I think uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, PBS is 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 moving that direction. So I think it's becoming pretty clear that that, that it's going to be generally available. But if you if you if you need some particular thing uh, and you want to get it out of Pimix. You know, be sure you uh, provide it or include it in your RFPs, especially at the desired feature levels so that people know what it is you actually want. We are restructuring the standard document to make that easier so you can be clear about, well, I want PIMIX, you know, according to these particular feature levels uh, per the standard. So we are trying to make that easier. Um, you can ask your, your vendor to, to go ahead and, and, uh, and integrate it to that desired feature level if you already have uh, uh, a system, and if you and if it's if you find you just don't have it or you, you can't get it as quickly as you like, you know consider using Perte as a shim. That's something that people have found to be uh, fairly easy to do and be uh, fairly uh, uh, useful. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff. Okay, here I am. Uh, Kenneth, there we go. He gave me the ball. Let me share my screen. All right. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, let's jump into this part of it, which is overall OpenMPI configuration and debugging types of things. Um, this is just kind of a roll up of uh, a bunch of the questions that we hear most commonly um and you know our suggestions for working through them at at your site so we usually give the same first several steps to do that if you're having problems with open mpi start you know particularly if they're launching problems or you're launching and weird things are happening right off the bat you know it's not something deep in your mpi program but something regarding launch or initial, um, you know, uh, starting of the application across one or multiple hosts, things like that. Here's what we suggest that you do. Um, start with something simple. Start with a non-MPI program. Fun fact, uh, MPI run, and regardless of whether you're in uh, 4.x and below or 5.x and above, so that's, you know, are you using the old Orte system or the new Perte system, doesn't matter you can actually launch non-MPI programs. So host name that I have listed there, that's just the Linux you know, host name or, or POSIX host name application. So just start trying to run uh, a small non-MPI application and make sure that launches, right? That covers a whole wide swath of things right there. SSH keys, permissions, all kinds of, of things like that. So this basically just tests whatever the underlying OpenMPI runtime system is. Again, regardless of whether it's Orte in OpenMPI 4X and below, or Perte in OpenMPI 5X and above. So doesn't test anything about MPI at all. This is just the basics of the runtime itself. And once you get that working, then try a trivial, all right, let's start up the MPI process and then shut down the MPI stuff. Um, don't actually send any MPI messages, but just you know, start up the MPI layer, shut down the MPI layer, do a hello world kind of thing. We have a hello world example program in the open MPI distribution tarball. Um, it's in a couple of different languages. I'm showing the one here for the C language. So if you go into the examples directory and you type make, 
you will see a hello underscore C. So you can just try running that and it'll print out a, a kind of a lengthy hello world message. It says, hello, I am X of Y and I think it prints the host name and the build string and a couple other things like that. But get that working. Sort through any you know file system or permissions problems that you have with OpenMPI complaining that it can't find plugins or whatever, whatever the problems are there. Once that actually works, then take the next step of actually doing network-based communication. So Ring is another program that we have in that same examples directory there. And again, this is the C version of the Ring program. Run that guy. Um, and here I'm showing all of these just running it on a single node, right? A single server, whatever, whatever your favorite language is for a single machine, right? This will actually do some MPI sends and receives. And so it will actually fire up the MPI layer, then also fire up the networking layer. Um, and so this can work you through uh, network selection mechanisms, network stack API and library uh, selection issues, all kinds of things like that. So each of these build on and, and activate more of the open MPI code base as you go along. Now, once you get beyond one node, then actually add a little complexity and do it on multiple nodes. So I am actually using syntax on here that just specifies the three hosts, host one, host two, host three, and the little colon one there says we can, we have one slot on each of those hosts. So hence the NP3, run three processes, one each on each of those host names. And do the same thing with host name, hello C and ring C. Again, building on that complexity of just try the launcher across multiple hosts, then just fire up and shut down the MPI layer, and then actually pass some MPI messages between them. Now, you might also pass this through your batch scheduler, right, where you, then you might not need the dash dash host uh, command line parameter to specify where it's running. So if you run through Slurm or Torque or whatever your favorite uh, local system is, you might not need this whole dash dash host thing. I just put it on here for reference uh, for unmanaged environments where you have just SSH, for example, uh, and you got to specify it on the command line where to run. All right. These things will, uh, as I said, this sequence is really very helpful in smoking out problems, starting at the bottom and working all the way to the top where you have actually an MPI application that is passing MPI traffic. Now, the next things here are other problems that we hear often. So the first one, the very first problem we hear a lot of is, please check your path and check your LD library path. Um, particularly for first time users, um, people who are just getting used to parallel programming and like, wow, my application is running on lots and lots of servers simultaneously. That's something you gotta wrap your head around. This is not normal, right? What we're doing is pretty complicated stuff here in the HPC community. And the concept of running on lots of, of servers simultaneously is a little weird. Um, and so they don't think about like, oh, you know, my dot bash RC or whatever my shell startup files are, need to set the path and LD library path, even for remote non-interactive logins, right? Uh, or bash scripts, right? Um, Slurm and other bash in, uh, or, um, Scheduled environments tend to take care of this for you by propagating the environment of the head node onto uh, all the nodes where you're actually running, but that isn't necessarily universally true. Um, so we strongly encourage people to check their path and their LD library path, both locally and remotely, um, to make sure that you are actually getting the open MPI installation or MPI installation that you think you're getting, right? You, are you getting uh, the MPI run that you expect, are you getting the libmpi.so that you expect, et cetera, et cetera. Um, sometimes uh, you can be surprised that there's a, um, just some kind of loophole that on some remote nodes, you're getting a different libmpi altogether, and that's why things are just completely falling apart. Now, I put in here bonus points too. Um, the Linux command for checking what libraries your program links against is LDD. So if you run LDD in the name of your MPI application, it should show you all the libraries it's going to link against. And it's using your current LD library path and other system setup to show you where those libraries are. So it's not going to just show you, oh yeah, it's going to link against libmpi.so. It's going to show you the absolute path of libmpi.so. So this is just another way to verify 
that you're getting the library that you think you're getting um, at runtime. Another common thing that we've seen in the last couple of versions of Mac OS, I don't remember exactly when this started, but it was at least a version or three ago. Um, the dollar tempter value that you get when you launch a shell on Mac OS is really long. It's not slash temp. It's slash blah, 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 really long type of things. Now, this can actually cause some problems for OpenMPI because we start in dollar tempter and then make shared memory files. We have, we have some metadata files, uh, all temporary stuff during the, the execution of your MPI job. Sometimes we can exceed the max file name size for the file system. And you get fairly amorphous errors back, I will say. Um, and so on Mac OS, we actually encourage people to say, you know what, just override tempter. Make a home slash temp and then export tempter equals home temp. And then you should be well underneath these max file name sizes. Um, it's a little annoying. Uh, Mac OS did it for reasonable reasons, to be honest. We can't really complain about that. But it is something that catches people by surprise. Um, and so this is something to be aware of. And we see this because people love to develop and test on their laptop, which is a completely reasonable thing to do. Um, they want to do small runs on their laptop and then take their application over to the big iron, uh, like an organizational resource uh, at your university or your research organization or your company, whatever um, type of thing. So be aware of that for Mac OS runs. Uh, third thing that we see is that uh, we unfairly get blamed. And of course, we all want to say that, like, no, it's not our fault at all. Uh, we all know every layer of software has bugs. I wish OpenMPI didn't have bugs, you know, but we do sometimes have bugs. Um, but point being here is that if somebody runs an MPI application and it crashes, you might get quite a few error messages out. And the stuff at the bottom of your screen may make it look like it was OpenMPI's fault, or Pimix's fault, or Perte's fault, or Orte's fault, or something underneath the actual application. That may not be the actual cause of why the application crashed. Um, you're just seeing the bottom of the chain, and the bottom of the chain may not show the first thing that went wrong that was the real problem, and then everything else that happened after that was a consequence of the real first problem. So a canonical thing that we tend to see is that like, oh, you know, there was actually a bug in the application. It caused a seg fault. You went over, a overran a buffer, something, right? One MPI process died due to a seg fault in, you know, legit programming bug in the application. But then another MPI process tried to communicate with that one and they got an error because that process was no longer around, so MPI then aborted. And if you only look at the last couple of lines of output, um, you're gonna see, oh yes, MPI chose to abort because you know we couldn't communicate with process 13. And you don't realize that process 13 actually died to a legit uh, problem in the application itself. So our guidance is always you know, scroll back up, make sure you find that initial error and that will actually get you on the road to finding out what your problem is and moving on from there. Another question that we get is, how can I tell which network I'm using? A lot of, uh, a lot of environments out there have multiple networks. For example, um, Ethernet and InfiniBand, or Ethernet and uh, Cray-based networking. Whatever it is, you want to make sure that you're using the good networking, whatever it is. Uh, I'm in Cisco, so we're an Ethernet loving company, but we even have machines where I just, you know, you have multiple Ethernets out there. One of them is one gig Ethernet, the other is 40 gig Ethernet. So you want to make sure you're using the right 40 gig Ethernet and you're not also spraying across, you know, the gigabit Ethernet, which would just slow everything down. Um, so if you look back at part two of the seminar, I, I uh, in the slides or, or go back and look at the video, I talked about how you can force a given network to be used. That is the absolute best way to know. Usually OpenMPI will pick the best one for you, but there are definitely cases where OpenMPI can't know and it needs a human to say like, oh, I want you to use this network or, or this set of networks. Um, don't use the other ones over here. Like you might have multiple 40 gig networks and one of them's for storage and one of them is for MPI. There's no way OpenMPI can know that unless 
uh, an administrator or a human otherwise tells OpenMPI which one to use. So go back and look at part two for that. Um, and you can also use this in conjunction with MPI benchmarks. Make sure you're getting the performance you're, you expect. If you're using InfiniBand, if you're using you know, high-speed Ethernet, if you're using whatever, run and make sure you're getting on that order of magnitude of performance. If your performance is significantly lower or your latency is significantly higher than you expect, you should go back and investigate, hey, which network am I actually using? And pair that with these uh, MCA parameters to force which network is being used and then see why that's not being why that's not happening automatically. Um, side note, I probably should have put on this slide here, if you find that you do need to give OpenMPI assistance on which network to use, you can always set those MCA parameters in the system-wide parameter file so that your users don't all have to specify a couple of different MCA parameters to make sure they use the right environment or the right network. You, as uh, you know, the administrator of the HPC environment, can put this in a system-wide config file that we've talked about earlier, um, and then your users, they just MPI run A dot out. They, they don't know, they don't care, which is kind of the level of service that we like to give to our users. Um, also, we have an additional feature coming in version 5.0, which I'll talk about in a, in a few slides. Um, this is a not uncommon question, but it mostly does come from independent software vendors. Um, they say like, all right, we build Open MPI, but then the customer can choose to install our application, which includes Open MPI, into an entirely different directory uh, on the target machine and the customer's environment. Well, we actually do have three different environment variables for this, and I included the PERTE one because that's for Open MPI 5 and above. So if you reset these three environment variables, that will reorient Open MPI to say, oh, this is where I should expect to find all my plugins my help files, the metadata, the config files, all these kinds of things. Um, didn't want to spend a huge amount of time on this, but we do get this question periodically, so I figured I'd put it in here. Um, here's a super horrible issue um, that we have seen coming up due to aggregation of what we've done with some of our, our libraries. So we've split out PIMIX. Um, we've split out Perte is not so much of an issue because the libraries are not an issue there, but we've had requests from the Linux distros to say, hey, stop embedding HWLOC, stop embedding PIMIC, stop embedding libevent. We want to use the system installed ones and not have an extra copy just for OpenMPI. Completely reasonable request, actually. So in starting in OpenMPI 4, we, uh, OpenMPI actually prefers an external copy of PIMIX, HWOC, and LibEvent if it finds them when you run the configure. And I talked all about this back in, in part one, so go back and have a listen to that and look through the slides there for, for the details on that. However, it can get a little confusing um, because these libraries are becoming more and more popular in an HPC environment. Sometimes the applications themselves will also link against these libraries and potentially make their own calls into the library. So like if they're linking against PIMIX, you want to absolutely make, make sure that OpenMPI is using the same lib PIMIX.so that the application is. Because if they're not, if they're just a little different um, and you have two different copies of lib PIMIX.so in a Linux process, uh, all manner of bad things will happen. And it, it really can be effectively random behavior. You will see random segfaults, uh, random crashes, or uh, this you know, variable was uninitialized because it actually initialized it in the other copy of the library. This stuff can be really insane to, to track down. Um, so be aware that this can be an issue, almost certainly when the applications themselves are using HWLOC, LibEvent or PIMIX, and then OpenMPI itself, we are using all three of those things as well. So if the applications are using these libraries, be really, really aware of this duplicated library thing and make sure that the application is using the same libraries that OpenMPI is. Not just the same version, but the same .so itself. That is the best way to guarantee that uh, you don't have this duplicated library inside of a single process space issue. Um, 
There are a huge number of caveats here. I'm not going to go into all of them here because every time I go down one of these paths and think that I understand how runtime linkers work, I find out that I don't know anything about how runtime linkers work. Um, so there's a lot of corner cases. Just go simple. Don't try and make a cut like, well, this should work. No, no, no. Use the same libpivx.aso. Use the same libhwloc.so and so on. Avoid all those corner cases and things that you think should work. All right, now, how do you get help from the community? Um, well, there are a couple of vendors out there. So uh, first off, I didn't even put on here, you should be talking to your vendor if you're having a problem, particularly with their network or their environment. They're probably your first step. But if you are just a, a random person out there and you've just downloaded OpenMPI and run it on your machine, uh, your laptop or your environment, great. We actually have uh, tons of resources out there for you. Um, here is the link to the help page. It is probably a bit intimidatingly long, but for good reason. We really need you to supply as much detail as possible. OpenMPI is used in a huge variety of environments across the world. Um, we don't know how you're running your job. We don't know how it's configured. We don't know what equipment you have. We don't know how the local environment is set up. So we need you to supply as much detail as possible, right? Don't assume that we know what you know, because we are not sitting there right next to you. We don't know anything about your local environment, even though it's probably well known to all of your users. Um, so please describe what your program is supposed to do, describe what it's actually doing, and if at all possible, please give us a small reproducer problem, um, our program. Uh, please don't point us to like, oh, I'm just using this giant uh, well-known application and this is happening. If you can give us a small example, that is so much more helpful because we may not be familiar with, you know, giant popular application that is very useful in your environment. We may not know anything about that. Um, another thing to do is, and I mentioned this in a previous slide, check your baseline MPI performance in your environment, right? Right. Run some MPI benchmarks. The Ohio State ones are, are a decent uh, set of benchmarks. They will tell you what your baseline performance is and compare that to what you're seeing in your application if you're seeing a performance problem. If your baseline performance is, is horrible, then it's probably not an application problem. It's probably something in your environment, right? Those kinds of things. All right, so that's uh, my tips on debugging and configuration kinds of things. Let's talk a little roadmap -y stuff. So let's talk about the 4.1 series. And the 4.1 series is actually coming up soon-ish. And I put, uh, it's expected approximately in August. Uh, we'll see how this goes. Um, so what's coming in 4.1? Um, well, there's a bunch of general performance improvements, which is stuff that is just ongoing work we always do. Like, oh, hey, we can tweak a little thing and make a little thing better there. Not really worth mentioning in detail, but there's always the miscellaneous performance improvements. Um, some tangible things. Um, so there are some libfabric and otherwise known as Open Fabrics interfaces improvements. So they actually support multi-device environments now in the OFI MTL. Um, and there's also some one-sided performance improvements. Not going to go into the details of how that works, but basically in LibFabric environments, uh, our friends at uh, HPE and Amazon and Cray and elsewhere all worked on these things to you know, support multi-device environments and also increase uh, performance for the MPI one-sided uh, MPI, MPI put, MPI get, and so on. Um, University of Houston, uh, our friends down there did a lot of improvements to Umpio. So Umpio, I again mentioned uh, in, um, I think it was part one, uh, that is our whole set of API for doing the MPI parallel IO. So they added support uh, for, oops, I'm sorry, Luster should not be there. I will remove that uh, before the slides are published. But they added support for IME and GPFS Luster support is coming in version 5.0. Sorry, that did not make it back to 4.1.0. Um, and since this is a, a minor release, 4.1, 4.x, it is backwards compatibility with the 4.0.x series, including ABI compatibility. So if you did compile something against 4.0.something, you should be able to just MPI run and not have to recompile or relink with the 4.1.x series. Now, there is a, a big notable new thing here, um, something that is perhaps a bit overdue, 
uh, we've been working on so many other things that we really probably did not give enough attention to our collective performance. And over the years, uh, our collective performance kind of stagnated and some of our competitors, frankly, had better uh, collective performance than we did. So we did two rounds of improvements in the 4.1 series. So we did general algorithm tuning selection improvements. And what that means is, let's say you call MPI BCAS. There's a number of very well-known algorithms that have existed in the literature for two decades for here's all the different ways you can do a broadcast efficiently. But we still have to choose which one is used at runtime. How many peers are there? How many hosts do they span? How big is the message that you're broadcasting? These things affect which broadcast algorithm you should choose. We basically tuned up all of that stuff and kind of improve them a bit. And that gives us a modicum of, of improvement, just baseline off the top right there. In addition to that, we actually have two new collected modules. This is all new code uh, based on years and years of research from the universe, our friends at the University of Tennessee. Um, now these modules are new and I wouldn't call them battle hardened yet. I, I wouldn't call them uh, robust for the entire world to use that. So they are available or they are going to be available in 4.1.0, but they are not the default. You must select them uh, and manually enable them yourself. That being said, they show significant performance improvements compared to our prior generation of stuff. We really need some real world testing though. And so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit more about what these two uh, modules are. So the ADAPT module, the whole idea of this one is to tolerate scheduling noise. So processes that are descheduled, which is not common, but it happens, or processes that are just late uh, in joining a collective. This, the whole idea of the ADAPT algorithms is that they are done on an event-driven uh, kind of framework rather than I am just in the algorithm and doing nothing else. So it kind of relaxes lots of unnecessary synchronizations. So the, the graphs on the right here are a bunch of tests done by our friends at the University of Tennessee on Cori which is a big machine at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs in the United States. And they did this across 1,024 cores. And so what they did here is you can see uh, four different groups of output. The top one is with MPI broadcast. The bottom is with MPI reduce. And there are three colors in each one. Uh, in the colors, there was no noise injected and we just did a straight broadcast to reduce. The red one is where we introduce zero to 10 milliseconds of noise, about 5% kind of noise. Uh, and the green one is when we introduced uh, zero to 20 milliseconds of noise or about 10% of noise. Uh, and you can see how things work. So Intel MPI is on the left, Cray MPI is in the middle. This is a Cray machine, by the way. Uh, the Open MPI current generation is the third one. And then the fourth one on the right is using ADAPT. And you can see um, the, pleasingly that OpenMPI ADAPT is the lowest of the four. And so that's awesome. We are very pleased with that. Um, the next one is the Han Collectives, and that stands for Hierarchical Aware Networking. And yes, as you, if you have seen parts one and part two, we have a lot of Star Wars references. It, this is a Star Wars reference. There's just no way around it. Um, so what Han collectives do is support two level hierarchies, uh, intranode and internode, and it basically reshapes the collective to just minimize how much stuff you send off node. And again, it's not actually implementing the collectives itself, it's just being the topology aware one and using a uh, topology aware piece and using that to select which collectives, uh, which algorithms are used for both on and off nodes and doing a separation between the two. And this picture is kind of a joke because it's not the young dashing Han, it's the old grizzled Han who has learned over many years uh, what all the right things are to do. It's not the mileage, it's not the years, it's the mileage. Um, so here's some performance, uh, and this is on Stampede 2 at TAC, which is the University of Te uh, Texas in um, uh, the US. Uh, these are actually the same graph, but small messages is broken out on the top and large messages is broken out on the bottom. So the x-axis is the message size in bytes. And you can see at the top, we stop at 128K and then on the bottom, we continue 128K and larger. And the y-axis is time. So of course, lower is better. Um, you can see a, a clear win here. So we're showing with Intel and Vapich 2, uh, the open MPI current generation, and then open MPI Han. And then in all cases, Han is the lowest red line on there, which is super pleasing. Uh, and 
uh, most importantly, we're getting open MPI uh, off of the most embarrassing or the old generation of open MPI, uh, you know, off of the top line in the small messages, which is the most embarrassing slot. So great, I told you uh, we have these things. How do you use them? All right, well, in OpenMPI 4.1, you can uh, enable them in one of two ways. You can set their priorities of these two modules to 100, uh, or you can just include it in the call MCA parameter itself. So put them, you know, Han, comma, adapt, comma, tune, comma, SM, comma, basic. Um, again, you can put these in site-wide files if you want. I wouldn't encourage that yet. Uh, I would encourage you to have your users try this. Um, maybe give them uh, uh, an alias or something that makes it easy to test, depending on the skill level and comfortableness uh, that your users have. But please have them test them. We could really, really, really use some real-world application testing with this stuff. Now, if you really want to get into the nuts and bolts of this, you don't have to use ADAPT and HAN together. You could actually uh, enable them separately. So you can use them separately or together. Um, there's, we actually have more performance results that I didn't include here for timing reasons. Uh, for We just have so many times to present these slides. But if you include both of them together, you get even better results, obviously. Um, but in this case, you can examine both of them individually if you like. All right, so that's kind of the, the high points of the 4.1, which is a nice solid incremental build on the 4.0 series, a bunch of backwards compatible things. So let's talk about the 5.0 series. The 5.0 series, well, honestly, frankly, we thought that was gonna happen in the beginning of the year, uh, but many things did not happen. So COVID happened, uh, we found some of the development was taking longer than we expected, um, all kinds of things. We still plan to hope to release in 2020, um, see how that goes. Um, maybe supercomputing, since it's 100% virtual this year, will actually take a little time, a little less time for all of us this year. Um, so we'll see. Um, but what we did end up doing since 5 got delayed, we moved a bunch of the backwards compatible pieces back to 4.1. So that's why 4.1 has a whole bunch of nice new stuff in it. And as we get into the next slides here, um, it, it'll look like, oh, okay, well, I could see how you would have included that in 5.0 but since it was backwards compatible, you just pulled it back to 4.1 so we can get those cool features out to users earlier. Um, in 5.0, there's uh, just like with 4.1, there's a million minor improvements as well that we're not even gonna talk about here. However, very, very important, we are breaking backward compatibility with the 4.x series. So the API is broken. MPI, as Ralph talked about in all of his slides and all part three of this basically, MPI run command line arguments are a little different. There's a bunch of stuff that is different. The broad strokes are the same, dash dash host, dash NP, um, dash dash MCA. The broad strokes are the same of the MPI line, command line parameters. However, uh, a bunch of MCA parameters are gone, like Ralph talked about, all the Orte ones are gone. Some of the others have changed names, things like that. If you have scripts that are used for launching your jobs, you may need to re-examine them for 5.0. So this is a big heads up. Um, I know it's a big deal. I know it's going to cause some disruption, but it was really kind of needed on our part to kind of refresh the back end. Um, this is going to require new debuggers and new tools. Um, there's a back end technology called MPIR that tools and debuggers used to uh, connect to running MPI jobs. That is no longer supported. Um, TotalView and DDT are releasing updated support to handle new PIMIX based things. PIMIX is our way forward. And there's now native stuff built into PIMIX to handle all these kinds of things. There is a shim if you absolutely cannot upgrade your tools. And here's the URL here, which you can get from the slides when we publish them later, which will ease your transition from MPIR. But really, we need to encourage you to, you know, and to encourage your vendors to move up to PIMIX. This is something, frankly, we announced a couple of years ago, and uh, we thought it would only take one year to get rid of MPIR. It's taken a couple of years, but now, honestly, the community is in a much better place that there are viable alternatives. Those viable alternatives are actually uh, fairly stable and mature, and they're actually getting rolled into all the various vendor products out there. So we're actually in a pretty good place that by the time 5.0 comes out, there will be viable alternatives. Well, actually, there are many viable alternatives that will continue to be more evolution along that line. Um, Ralph, I'd like to actually have you talk about this slide because this is all about 
Forte and Perte. So if you were actually still on the call, could you give a quick run through of this? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, some of the biggest changes coming, um, and this top one is probably the, the, the biggest one that uh, this group want to be aware of. Um, we've dropped all support for PMI1 and PMI2. So um, so you, the old way of, of linking against uh, the SLRM or Cray PMI1, PMI2 libraries, that's no longer going to work with OPV5. We only support PMIX. We've gone that way because both of those uh, environments support PIMIX now. And so there's no reason for us to have to support multiple things again anymore. And also, we really wanted to, to expand the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, our use of PIMIX to take advantage of all these new features that PIMIX offers. So, uh, so that's the one, one big thing. Um, I mentioned earlier that Orte is being replaced by Perte. Uh, one of the changes there is that uh, other than the MPI forms uh, standard uh, single dash options that we have to support, um, we don't support single dash multi-character options anymore. Uh, so you'll have to do double dash. Um, we are nice about it. We do tell you that. We do warn you and uh, and then move on uh, for now. But eventually we will just simply drop it. Um, yeah, and let me mm -hmm. jump in right there. Uh, I, I will take the blame for this one because way back at the beginning of OpenMPI, I wrote the command line parsing code and we accepted things like single dash MCA, single dash report bindings, all these kinds of things. But that, in hindsight, that was probably a poor choice because even back then, that was not GNU or POSIX compliance or common. And uh, so for those of you who have gotten accustomed to doing those single dash options, sorry, we're, we're fixing that mistake now. Uh, there's also the, you know, the adaptive command line, like I mentioned, it requires a little additional setup. And, uh, and I also talked about the MCA parameters. The, the big change is really uh, in terms of other than the PMI1, PMI2 support, uh, PIMIX is now a, a first class citizen. Um, internally, which you guys won't see that much, but internally, there's a lot of things that got cleaned up and we just, uh, and, and streamlined. Uh, so we just, everything calls just PMIX and we're done. So what that means though, is that you actually can configure uh, OMPI to build just the MPI layer with no runtime support at all. And it will work in direct launch environments. So like you know, S run or app run, it will just work uh, provided that they support PIMIX of course, but, uh, but you don't need to build the runtime at all if you don't want to use it. Um, the PIMIX symbols are all exposed, so anybody who links against OpenMPI has immediate access to all the PIMIX calls. And um, the uh, uh, the other thing was that the the info keys, the MPI info key names, um, that we uh, that are non-standardized, so the ones that MPI does not require, they're all now PIMIX attributes instead of just arbitrary names that uh, won't be used. And we did that for a particular reason, and that is that one of the complaints that we get a lot is in the MPI implementation world is that if I ever want to use MPI info keys and I want to move my program from open MPI to, to, uh, to MPISH, let's say, all the info key names change again. And so my program isn't, you know, it needs to be completely configured with all these, you know, if it's MPISH, use these names, if it's open MPI, use these names. We're trying to get away from that. So we just said, look, it just we're just using PIMIX attributes. And since that's a standard, hopefully we'll get other people to use the same thing. And that way your program will now be completely uh, uh, portable between the MPI implementations, um, at least the compile time. So so that's that's those are the big changes that I that I can report on. So back to Jeff here. Awesome. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, a couple more features that are coming in 5.0 is user level fault mitigation. And this is also research that has come out of the University of Tennessee. Otherwise known, you may have heard the acronym ULFM. Um, so it's a programming model that you can use uh, inside the MPI API to create uh, fault resistant uh, applications. So if you lose a process, you can actually still continue, things like that. 
Um, also, uh, we added support for ABX instructions for MPI op operations. So it makes your MPI reductions, makes it, it accelerates the compute side of that. So remember with MPI reduce, there's both a compute side and a communication side. So very little work had been done to accelerate the compute side. We finally did that to take advantage of ABX instructions that are available on Intel and AMD types of uh, architectures. Um, also with our friends from the national labs, a couple of different national labs actually, uh, we added support for user level threads packages, uh, Qthreads and Argobots. Um, so that's pretty cool stuff. Hopefully by the time 5.0 comes out, we'll have ADAPT and HAN, the collective modules that I just talked about a few minutes ago, they'll be nice and battle hardened and production ready and we'll be able to make those the default. So big hopefully there, but this is why we need your testing and uh, shake out the bugs in uh, your environments. Um, the OpenID BPTL is gone. Um, so for years and years and years, we have supported InfiniBand um, and iWarp and Rocky through the OpenID BPTL. In the 4.x series, the UCX PML has started replacing that. Um, and OpenID's journey will come to an end at 5.0. So it will not be included in 5.0 at all. The UCX PML is going to be what is used for all InfiniBand support. Um, also, something that I've been asking for for a long time, the Vader BTL has been renamed to SM because Vader BTL is for shared memory communication, and that name was extremely user hostile. It didn't give you any indication what that module was for. So it's now going to be SM in 5.0, although there is still a Vader alias. So if you have scripts that are still referring to the name Vader, uh, please update them for OpenMPI.5.0, but that itself will not uh, break you because Vader has been a very pervasive name for the last several years. We won't just give that a, uh, give that up in one one version. There will be at least some elements of MPI4. Um, the MPI4.0 document is due by the end of 2020. Um, the MPI forum, uh, amusingly enough, COVID has made uh, the MPI forum more efficient. So they're actually making tremendous amounts of progress in terms of the MPI-4 document that's due by the end of this year. Um, can't really tell you exactly which features are gonna be included 5.0 or not. We actually, the Open MPI developer community has a meeting next Monday, um, and uh, that is one of the things that we're gonna be discussing. A bunch of the Open MPI community are on the forum itself, and so a lot of them have prototypes that just need a bit of hardening before they come into Open MPI, but those things will be coming in over time. I, I, kind of guessing that in open MPI 5, we will not be 100% MPI 4 compliant, but that's okay, all that stuff will come in over time. Uh, one thing that has been asked for quite a bit is, and I referred to it earlier in the presentation, is the connectivity map. Um, please show me which network were used at runtime. Now, we do have a solution um, that is actually already in our master. I think we're gonna end up uh, updating this a little bit. So what I'm showing here on this slide is still subject to change a little bit. Um, if you, there's a couple of MCA parameters you can use. There's one that I listed here, hook com method enable MPI, which is a heck of a mouthful in itself. But if you turn it on, it kind of shows this map. Um, and uh, I am showing here just um, uh, a four process job across two servers, MPI002 and MPI004. And you can see, oh, shared module or shared memory, not Vader, but shared memory is used uh, um, on the, you know, identity communication on the same server communication. And US NIC, which is uh, the Cisco networking, is used uh, across nodes there. Um, so it'll look something like this. Um, and, but, and there are more features to, to deal with this, but this is a, a common thing that we've been at, people have been asking us for for years. So something along these lines will be included in 5.0. And with that, I have hit uh, the end of my slides and Ralph is gonna laugh at me because I went longer than he did, um, but I can blame it on him because he talked about that one slide a couple minutes ago and that was at least 20 minutes in itself. Um, so he's the one that caused us to go over. <laughs> Okay, good. Yes, we, we do have, have uh, questions. Yes, we do have a couple of questions. So let me scroll back. First of all, let me maybe start with a question I had, um, which relates to to the P run that uh, Ralph was talking about. So um, you you clarified one of the questions we had in part two, 
um, which was about MP Iron versus Ezran. And now Piran is being added, which may lead to even more confusion. Um, so, so I'm wondering if you can clarify how Piran relates to MP Iron and maybe also to Ezran. So where does it fit in, in that whole story? So um, first off, uh, if you're just running open MPI, you know, MPI run will work just like it always has. You don't have to worry about any of these nuts and bolts. Um, P run is, is used mainly when you're talking about running a PERTE as a separate uh, DVM, a distributed virtual machine, and you want to run multiple jobs underneath it. P run is your starter for doing that. Um, it's it it effectively uh, acts like S run would would work for Slurm. Okay, uh, the only difference being that P run has the adaptive command line, so the command line looks exactly like the OMPI MPI run if you're running OMPI jobs. It looks exactly like the MPISH command line if you're running MPISH jobs. So um, uh, it's it's designed to be kind of flexible in that way. Uh, but it does require this configuration of being able to tell us what the uh, what the alias is linked to, so we know which one, what, whether you're running an OMP job or a, or an MPISH job. We need to have something that tells us that. There is a command line option that you can use on PRun that will do that automatically. So you can just say PRun person you know dash dash personality MPISH, and we'll know that okay, this is an MPISH command line, and we'll we'll uh, parse it accordingly. Does that help answer your question, Kenneth? Yeah, I, I think it does. It seems long term. The intention is that P run will actually replace S run, and there will no be there won't be any custom commands like this anymore. Is that correct? I wouldn't go that far. I I think the various resource managers are always going to want to have their own. Um, I think that you'll find uh, more people using P run for like workflow management and things like that, where they the the the, uh, the ability to have that persistent DVM in place and to get around the limitations that you find like in Slurm or, or, the, or the Shasta or Alps environments. You want that consistent environment that allows you know, to run a lot of jobs quickly. I think you'll see P run becoming more prevalent there. Okay, good. Yeah, I think that clarifies things a bit. Um, so we did have one dumb question. So the person himself mentioned it as a dumb question. Um, how do I know that the results I get from the um, OZU benchmarks are reasonable, or if my environment is already screwed up. So, is there any reference timings or things like this to that's, compare that's a good it? question. Um, let me uh, let me let me preface this by saying there are HPC class networks and there are non HPC class networks, and I'm not I I want to stay away from individual vendors here. But let's say, um, well, here, I'll just use one, one gigabit Ethernet, right? Let's say you have a cluster with one gigabit Ethernet, right? You don't have any kind of acceleration on there at all. It's just a plain vanilla couple of machines with a commodity gigabit switch. Um, you don't have any special NICs in there at all. No acceleration stack whatsoever. You're using plain vanilla Linux TCP sockets. On modern-ish machines, your MPI latency should probably be in the tens of microseconds. And by tens of microseconds, I mean anywhere from 20 to 80. Um, and that's basically no acceleration, commodity Ethernet, going through a switch, um, these kinds of things. So ping pong, you know, half round trip, ping pong latency should be anywhere from 20 to 80 microseconds. Um, I would call that a non-HPC class environment. Or, or non HPC class network, um, which is still perfectly fine for a lot of applications. So don't uh, take that as a derogatory term. I don't mean that as a derogatory term. What I mean as an HPC class network is things where acceleration are possible, where you can do better than just the generic Ethernet commodity kind of stuff, where you have InfiniBand or US NIC or, or um, uh, OmniPath or any of the other accelerated networks. In those types of networks, generally your latency, your MPI latency should be in the low single digits of microseconds. So one or sub one is really good. Um, two is pretty great as well. 
anything under 10 is is pretty good. Um, and those uh, can be very helpful in MPI applications that send tons of short messages between themselves frequently. That's why latency is one of the big uh, deals in uh, MPI, HPC class networking types of things. So latency is a good one to look at, uh, the first one to look at. The second <coughs> one is your bandwidth. Almost all networks, even the quote unquote non-HPC class networking, will get up to maximum bandwidth. So even if you have one gig or 10 gig or 40 gig, um, by the time the message gets large enough, you'll see the graph rise higher and higher that like, oh, by the time that I'm sending a one megabyte message, I'm actually getting, you know, 30, 35, 38 plus uh, gigabits worth of performance, that type of thing. Or, or whatever, you know, the, the top end of your uh, networking speed is. You should have a nice steep ramp to that. Now, that being said, if you have 100 gig Ethernet, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 100 gig Ethernet or 100 gig InfiniBand or things like that, it, it does just take a while, no matter even if you have an HPC class network or not, to ramp up to the high speed because you just cannot hit wire speed with a 16 byte message. Um, it just does not happen. You have to have a large enough message to be able to hit uh, max bandwidth. But in general, uh, the difference between an HPC class and a non-HPC class network is the slope of how fast you can ramp up to maximum bandwidth. So nice steep slope is what you want to see um, at lower message sizes that you can get maximum bandwidth versus, uh, oh, I got to you know, hit eight or 16 meg messages before I can start approaching maximum bandwidth. So latency is a great indicator. Uh, bandwidth is a good secondary indicator. Okay, yeah, I think that's very helpful. Hey, uh, Kenneth? Um, yeah, sure. Can I take you back to your question about um, P-Run for a minute? Um, okay. I just wanted to clarify some because the I, I, I answer wasn't complete. Um, and that is that if the, like Slurm or, or Shasta or whatever, uh, PBS, if they support uh, PMIX spawn integration, then you could, add, instead of using their launcher like S-Run, you could use PRUN to launch your jobs. So there is a path by which eventually um, you could actually be using PRUN as your standard launcher in, in all these environments. So. Okay, okay good. Um, maybe related to the, to the OZU question, um, I was wondering, so there's an, I think there's a release candidate now for uh, OMP 4.1. Um, so, what would be a recommended way for people to test that in their environment? I, I assume getting it installed is the first step, but then what? Do you just run Hello World stuff? Do you run benchmarks? Do you go real world applications? And how do you give that feedback back to the OpenMPI community? Yeah, great question. So, in, in OpenMPI 4.1, it should be a, a relatively low risk upgrade. Um, now, we do have just a release candidate out yet, and that release candidate doesn't include Adapt and Han. Hopefully, the next release candidate should include uh, Adapt and Han. But going from 4.0.x to 4.1.x should be a pretty small jump. Um, backwards compatibility should be preserved. All the command line, all the scripts you've been using for forever should be working just fine. Um, but generally, you know, great. Uh, that'd be awesome if you could go download the, the release candidate try to build it in your environment, um, install, I would install it next to your existing OpenMPI install. Don't replace it yet because it is just a release candidate. And like I said, two of the big things are not even in that release candidate tarball yet. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, install it next to it, set up your environment by modules or your shell scripts startup file, whatever you want to do, you know, change your path and LD library path to point to that new one. You should be able to just MPI run your existing MPI 4.0.x compiled applications. So if you just change your LD library path to point to the new libmpi, you should be good to go. Um, and just test all the usual things. Test your usual, you know, make sure we didn't do something silly and break, you know, MPI run of hello world and ring and then move on, same thing with the troubleshooting, right? Then move on to real MPI applications. Those should all perform more or less the same. Um, and hopefully when Han and Adapt come along, uh, you can enable those. And if your application is using MPI collectives, you should see some nice uh, performance improvements, hopefully. 
Um, there's a small follow-up question to the OZU benchmarks as well. Um, if there's a way to uh, plot the results that you get from the OZU benchmarks for quick interpretation. Is that something that's included uh, in the suite or separate tooling? I, I don't think it's included. I haven't looked at the latest, latest, latest version because honestly, I have an old version and <laughs> they, they haven't changed all that much over time. Um, I think it just emits stuff to standard out. Um, and you can do the parsing and plotting yourself using your favorite tool. I don't think they have any handy uh, Python and scripts or something like that to, to plot it for you. Now, uh, that may have changed. Yeah, I was just going to say, I was just looking at their website because I saw that question, and I just posted the link uh, to that because at the bottom, they in oh, fact do tell you how to make the plot using GNU plot script, and they give you, a, uh, they give you the script. Awesome. Okay, excellent. Thanks a lot, Ralph. Um, a follow-up question on ADAPT, so the new component in OMP 4.1 that's coming up. Um, Gaspar was wondering um, what's the magic behind ADAPT that's um, enabling it to increase the performance uh, even maybe without having noise. So what's behind that component? Um, so the way it was described to me uh, by Dr. George Basilica from the University of Tennessee is that they changed the framework of uh, how they are implemented. So instead of just being a blocking algorithm that says like, okay, I'm going to do a tree-based broadcast. And so I'm going to do a broadcast to you, or I'm going to do a send to, you know, my children in the graph. But if that child is not ready, I might end up blocking waiting for that child because he was late to the communication. Uh, so instead, they're doing more of uh, pipelining, um, which is something that we didn't do a whole lot of in our, our prior generation, um, paired with event-based programming kinds of things. So we already use libevent elsewhere in OpenMPI. I believe they're using libevent in ADAPT such that they're, they just submit all the work uh, in a graph kind of form to libevent, and libevent will fire it when, when it happens. I believe that is true. Don't take me. I'm not the guy who wrote that work. Um, so that is my understanding. Hopefully it is correct. <laughs> okay, um, then another question, will the shim that's there to ease the transition from MPIR um, allow, for example, DDT to work against OMP 5.0 until ARM Forge gets around to updating? Uh, ARM Forge already has updated DDT to work with, uh, with PMIX. Um, okay. As I said in the in the chat window, there it's just they they are they're uh, synchronizing their release or coordinating their release schedule with when OMPV five comes out. Okay, good. Um, let's see what else. I think there was there was a question related to OMP five point Is the C API changing much? But I think that's a misunderstanding. It's actually the API changing. The API is not changing. Yes, the API is changing. Yes. Yeah, so okay. um, the C API is still standardized by the MPI specification itself. Um, and there haven't really been changes in that. Um, so MPI 4 is adding a whole bunch of stuff um, in the C and other APIs. So just to, just to clarify this whole line of things, um, uh, MPI 4 is adding a whole bunch of APIs um, and not really changing anything. Yeah, I don't, I don't think they're really changing anything. Um, but for OpenMPI 5, we are breaking the ABI, so it'll be a different SO number. So if you symbolically linked, I'm sorry, if you linked against, uh, you know, the shared library for LibMPI for OpenMPI 4 and earlier, it will not automatically relink at runtime to the LibMPI for OpenMPI 5 and beyond because that has a different SO number. Um, we changed some data structures around. Um, it's not so much the C API that changed. It's more internal stuff that users don't care about um, that changed, like sizes of structures and things like that, that really require us to bump the SO number and make an ABI break. Honestly, this is stuff that's been waiting for three or four years. We've delayed making this ABI change for a long time, um, and now we kind of really need to. So I'm sorry, uh, but we kind of just really need to do it. <laughs> okay, there was a follow-up question there, which Ralph has already answered. Is API stability guaranteed across minor releases? So I understand the answer is yes to that. So you, you 
we're really careful about um, keeping ABI compatibility as long as it's the same minor version. Okay. Um, yes. There's maybe a wrap up question and a small a naughty follow up question from me. So, Casp is wondering, uh, he's realizing it's an annoying question, but he was. Uh, he's asking about any more concrete expectation on the timeline for OMP 5.0. Uh, so you mentioned hopefully before yeah, the end it, of the year. Is that the best you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, first off, completely valid question. Um, second off, I will say uh, no. And let me tell you why I, I am not going to give you more firm on that. Um, the Open MPI community is great, actually. It's it has exceeded all of our expectations. Um, I was one of the founding people. I think, Ralph, you joined within three months of OpenMPI being founded, what are we at, 16, 17 years ago now? Yeah. Um, so Ralph is effectively one of the founders too. Um, we never dreamed that OpenMPI would be this successful. Um, we never dreamed that it would grow beyond the four initial organizations that were, that were doing this. Um, it has become a, a giant community with a lot of vendors and a lot of money behind it and whatnot, um, and it is fantastic. I, it, it makes me incredibly proud to see what the community has been able to achieve over the years. That being said, it does have its challenges. Um, one of the challenges is that um, as a community, we are not fiscally responsible to each other. Um, so I don't pay Ralph. Uh, Ralph doesn't pay me. I don't pay the University of Tennessee and so on and so on. And so synchronizing us all to have all the features done at the right time um, can be difficult. And this is true of every open source community out there, right? Um, that wrangling all the community members to actually have the features done on time can be difficult. This has traditionally been a problem in the open MPI community. It is unfortunately no different for OpenMPI 5.0. Um, so it's both a curse and a blessing that we have this incredibly rich, diverse community spread across many different types of organizations that bring different viewpoints and different goals and requirements to us. And the end result is that we actually get something pretty great because it does represent a pretty wide swath of, of viewpoints. Um, but the challenge in that is that uh, everybody uh, has their own internal timelines and deadlines and other projects that they have to work on and things like that. And so it can make forecasting uh, really difficult. So I'm sorry, that is just where we are. Yeah, well, I uh, I'd already answered on the, on, the, on the chat saying October, November is what we were hoping for, but <laughs> <laughs> that is aspirational. Um, uh, no, that, I, is, I was... that is what we're talking about internally. Yeah. Um, and so that's what we're aiming for. I, I really hope we're able to deliver that for you by supercomputing. Um, let's see what happens. Yeah, I, I confess I am one of the long poles in the tent this time around. And uh, Jeff is being kind not to point the finger at me. I'm not the only one, but I'm certainly one of them. And uh, if Jeff wants to pay me, uh, I will happily make that date for, for firm. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I guess realistically, if it's not November, then December is is a lot more difficult to make a big release. I guess so. Then yeah, we're, we, then we're looking at twenty twenty one. We we tend to avoid doing things like that because if you make a release right before a holiday, then there's nobody to answer the phone if something goes wrong. And yeah, so, yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I we've mean, done that a couple times. They're like, you know, we were ready in December, but you know what? We're just going to hold on to it till January for. Because yeah. there's so many holidays and everybody disappears. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, so we're I think we're out of questions from attendees. I did have one final question for you. Um, that's sort of a follow up to this. So it, it's pretty clear now what's gonna um, or what the targets are for OpenMPI five. But I was wondering if there's something you already have in mind for the next major release. Um, so is there anything that you you're not happy with at all in the current OpenMPI version that? <laughs> require breaking ABI compatibility or are there any major features you have in mind? Well, um, the, 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 we actually, the biggest we do feature, have a wiki page wait, Dr. for 6.0 already. Yeah. For the, sorry, the, ahead, big, the biggest feature for OMP 6.0 that I'm aware of is that I'm retiring before it happens. 
So, <laughs> <laughs> so you probably aren't going to see a lot of changes to the runtime anymore <laughs> when that happens. And we will be sorry to see you leave, sir. Um, but I will say we, we do have a wiki page for OpenMPI 6, which is very sparsely populated at the moment. Um, the biggest things that are on there are deprecating and removing old stuff. <laughs> um, that's why I'm kind of chuckling when you say that. that there, for example, the MPI-1 APIs um, that were removed in, I think, 2014 out of the MPI standard, um, they're still carried in OpenMPI, although they're not in MPI.h by default anymore. You have to specifically turn them on. That was us trying to ratchet up the pain on people, um, saying like, okay, you have to do an extra thing to get the MPI-1 <laughs> APIs. Um, we will be talking about that again in OpenMPI 6, saying can we actually finally get rid of these APIs that were deprecated in 1996 <laughs> and finally removed from the standard in 2014. So they've been gone for six years now, um, but it is still, I just had a question yesterday from someone who's actually on this call today saying, hey, I have an application that's failing to compile because of a symbol that's not there. I'm like, oh yeah, do this flag and then your thing will compile. And then please go talk to that application developer and get them to upgrade because um, it's very straightforward to get rid of and stop using those things. Anyway, that's my little soapbox for, that's what I, I remember I, offhand from the 6.0. I guess similar for the, the C++ API as well, which is already deprecated. Is that something that's going to finally be yeah, removed in 6? The C++ API is actually gone. We actually removed that one completely because okay. almost nobody was using it. Almost nobody was using it. These old MPI-1 APIs, they're actually still used. Um, the, the C++ API, there was a handful of apps that used it total, um, other than homework assignments. Um, and so getting rid of those was a lot easier. I got a question just yesterday about somebody who ran into an app that still needed it. So, um, so it, it's, huh? it's finally removed in, in OpenMPI-5 then? Because I think it's still there in four. You can correct. still enable it. Yeah. Okay. It okay. Is gone, good. Gone. 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 Um, I think we're ready to wrap up here. There's no more additional questions popping up. So uh, let me thank you again, both of you, for taking the time for doing this. Um, I think it was very useful for both the Easy Build community and the HPC community at large. Um, yeah. So thank you very much for taking the time. Yes. Yeah. Thank you all. Uh, we you. really appreciate the opportunity, like Alf said earlier, and um, thank you all for your attention. Yes. Thank you, and thank you, Kenneth. Happy to. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you all.